So, convolution and neural networks, I guess, today. All right, so foundations, uh, me, you know, I post nice things on Twitter, uh, follow me. No, I'm just kidding. All right, so again, anytime you have no idea what's going on, just stop me, uh, ask questions. Uh, let's make these lessons interactive such that I can try to please you and provide the necessary information uh, for you to understand what's going on. All right, so convolutional neural networks. How cool is this stuff? Very cool. Uh, mostly because before having convolutional nets, we couldn't do much. And we're going to figure out why now, uh, how, why, why and how these networks are so powerful and they are going to be basically making, uh, they are making like a very large uh, chunk of like the whole networks are used uh, these days. So more specifically, we are going to get used to repeat several times those three words, which are the key words for understanding convolutions, but we are going to be figuring out that soon. So let's get started and figuring out how these uh, signals, these images, and these uh, different items look like. So whenever we talk about uh, signals, we can think about them as vectors, for example. Uh, we have there a signal which is representing a monophonic audio signal. Uh, so given that is only, uh, we have only the temporal dimension going in, a, like the signal happens over one dimension, which is the temporal dimension, uh, this is called a 1D signal and can be represented by a singular vector as is shown up, up there. Uh, each uh, value of that vector represents the amplitude of the waveform. Um, for example, if you have just a sign, you're going to be just hearing like, like some, some sound like that. Uh, if you have like different kind of, uh, you know, it's not just a sign, uh, a sign you're going to hear uh, different kind of timbers or, or uh, different kind of, uh, yeah, different kind of uh, flavor of the sound. Um, moreover, you're familiar how sound works, right? So right now I'm just throwing air through my windpipe uh, where there are like some membranes which is making the air vibrate. These vibration propagate through the air. They are going to be hitting your ears and the ear canal. You have inside some little, uh, uh, you have like the cochlea, right? And then given about uh, how much the sound propagates through the cochlea, you're going to be detecting the pitch. And then by adding different pitch uh, information, uh, you can, and also like different kind of, uh, yeah, I guess pitch information, you're going to figure out what is the uh, sound I was making over here. And then you reconstruct that using your language model you have in your brain, right? And the same thing Jan was mentioning, uh, if you start speaking another language, uh, then you won't be able to parse the information because you're using both a speech model, like a, a conversion between vibrations and uh, uh, like, you know, signal in your brain plus the language model in order to make sense. Uh, anyhow, that was a 1D signal. Uh, let's say I'm listening to music. So what kind of signal do I uh, have there? So if I listen to music, usually this is going to be a stereo stereophonic, right? So it means you're going to have how many channels? Two channels. Two channels, right? Uh, nevertheless, what type of signal is going to be this one? It's still going to be 1D signal, although there are two channels. So you can think about, you know, regardless of how many cha uh, channels, like if you had Dolby Surround, you're going to have, what, 5.1? So 6, I guess. So that's the, um, you know, uh, vectorial, the uh, size of the signal, and then the time is the only variable which is uh, like moving forever, okay? So those are 1D signals. Uh, all right, so let's have a look, uh, let's zoom in a little bit. So we have, a, for example, on the left-hand side, we have something that looks like a sinusoidal uh, function here. Uh, nevertheless, a little bit after, you're gonna have again, the same type of uh, function appearing again. So this is called uh, stationarity. You're gonna see over and over and over again the same type of pattern across the temporal uh, dimension, okay? So first property of this signal, which is a natural signal because it happens in nature, is gonna be, we said, stationarity, okay? That's the first one. Uh, moreover, what do you think? Uh, how likely is, uh, if I have a peak on the left-hand side, to have a peak also 
very nearby. So how likely is to have a peak there rather than having a peak there given that you had a peak before? Or if I keep going, uh, how likely is you have a peak, you know, a few seconds later given that you have a peak on the left hand side? So there should be like some kind of common sense, common knowledge perhaps that uh, if you are close together, like if you are uh, close to the left hand side, is there's going to be a larger probability that uh, things are going to be looking uh, similar. For example, you have like a specific sound will have a very kind of specific shape. Uh, but then if you go a little bit further away from that sound, then there is no relation anymore uh, about what happened here given what happened before. And so if you uh, compute the cross correlation between a signal and itself, do you know what's a cross correlation? Uh, do no, like if you don't know, okay. How many, oh yeah, hands up who doesn't know what's a cross correlation? Okay, fine. So that's gonna be homework for you. You take one signal, just a signal, uh, an audio signal. Then you perform convolution of that signal with itself, okay? And so convolution is gonna be, you have your own signal, you take the thing, you flip it, and then you uh, pass it across, and then you multiply. Whenever you're gonna have them overlaid in the same, uh, like when there is zero uh, misalignment, you're gonna have like a spike. And then as you start moving around, you're gonna have basically two decaying uh, sides. Uh, that represents the fact that uh, things have much things in common. Basically, you're performing a dot product, right? So things that have much in common when they are uh, very close uh, to one specific location. If you go further away, things start, you know, averaging out. So here, the second property of this natural signal is locality. Information is contained in specific portion and parts of the, uh, in this case, temporal domain, okay? So before we had stationarity, now we have locality, right? Uh, bless you. All right, so how about this one, right? This is completely unrelated to what happened over there. Okay, so let's look at the uh, nice little kitten. Uh, what kind of dimensions, uh, what kind of, uh, yeah, what dimension has this signal? What, what's your guess? It's a two-dimensional signal. Why is that? Okay, we have also a three-dimensional signal uh, option here. So someone said two dimensions, someone said three dimensions. It's two-dimensional. Why is that? Sorry, noise. Why is two-dimensional? Because the information is... Oops, sorry. The information is um, spatially uh, depicted, right? So the information uh, is uh, basically encoded in the spatial location of those points. Although each point is a vector, for example, of three, or if it's a hyperspectral image, it can be uh, several planes, nevertheless, you still, uh, you still have two directions in which points can move, right? The thickness doesn't change uh, across, uh, like the thickness is a, of a given space, right? It's a given thickness and it doesn't change, right? So you can have as many you know, planes as you want, but the information is basically, uh, is a spatial information, is spread across the plane. So this is a two-dimensional um, data. You can also... Okay, I see your point. So a uh, black and white image or a, a, a grayscale image, uh, it's definitely a 2D uh, signal. And also, it can be represented by using a tensor of two dimensions. Uh, a color image has RGB planes, but the thickness is always three, doesn't change. And the information is still spread across the um, other two dimensions. So you can change the size of a color image, but you won't change the thickness of a color image, right? Um, so we are talking about here the dimension of the signal as how is the information uh, basically spread around, right? In the temporal information, if you have Dolby surround, a mono, mono signal, or you have a, a stereo, you still have over time, right? So it's uh, one dimensional. Images are 2D. So let's have a look to the little nice kitten and uh, let's focus on the, on the nose, right? Oh, oh my God, this is a monster now. <laughs> okay, a nice big uh, creature here, all right. Okay, so 
we observe there, and there is some kind of dark region uh, nearby the eye, you can observe that a kind of similar pattern appear over there, right? So what is this property of natural signals? I told you two properties. This is stationarity. stationarity. Why is this stationarity? Because uh, the same pattern repeats at different locations. Right, so the same pattern appears over and over again across the dimensionality. In this case, the uh, dimension is two dimensions, right? Uh, moreover, what is the likelihood that, given that the color in the pupil is black, what is the uh, pr likelihood that uh, the pixel uh, on the arrow, or the, like on the top, tip of the arrow, is also black? I would say it's quite likely, right? Because it's very close. How about that point? Yeah, kind of less likely, right? Uh, if I keep clicking, hmm, you know, it's completely, uh, it's bright now, no, the other pixel, right? So as further you go in spatial dimension, uh, the, the less, less likely uh, you're gonna have, you know, similar information. And so this is called okay. locality, which means there is a higher likelihood for things to have, inf like you, the, the information is like contained in a specific region. As you move around, things get uh, much, much more, um, uh, you know, independent. All right, so we have two properties. The third property is going to be the following. What is this? Are you hungry? So you, you can, can you see here some uh, donuts, right? No donuts, how do you call uh, bag bagels, right? All right, so for the, you, the, the one of you which have glasses, take your glasses off, and I'll answer my question. Okay. So the third property uh, is compositionality, right? And so compositionality means that the uh, word is actually explainable, right? Okay, you enjoy the, <laughs> the thing. Okay, get, get back to me, right? I, I just try to keep you alive. Uh, mm. hey, hey. Hello? Okay, for, for the one that doesn't have glasses, ask the friend who has glasses and try them on, okay? No, don't do it. It's it's not good. No, I'm just kidding. You can squint. Just squint. No, don't 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 use other people's glasses. Okay. <laughs> Question. Yeah. Um, could you explain again uh, how stationarity and locality is different? So uh, stationarity means you observe the same kind of pattern over and over again yeah. in your yes. data. Uh, locality means that pattern are just localized. So you have some specific information here, some information here, information here. As you move away from this point, this other value is going to be uh, quite almost independent from the value of this point here. So things are correlated only within a neighborhood. Okay. Okay. Everyone has been experimenting now, squinting and looking at this nice picture. Okay, so this is the third part, which is compositionality. Uh, here you can tell how you can actually see uh, something uh, if you blur it a little bit. Um, because again, things are made of small parts and you can actually, uh, you know, compose things in this way. Anyhow, so these are the three main properties of natural signals, which uh, allow us to um, can be exploited for making, you know, a design of an architecture which is more uh, actually prone to extract information that has these properties, okay? So we are just talking now about signals that exhibit those properties. Uh, finally, okay, there was the last one which I didn't talk. So we had the last one here. Uh, we have an English sentence, right? John picked up uh, the apple, apple, whatever. Uh, and here, again, you can represent each word as one vector. Uh, for example, each of those items, it can be a, uh, a vector which has a one in, correspondent, in correspondence to the position of where that word happens to be in a dictionary, okay? So if you have a dictionary of 10,000 words, you can just check whatever is the, uh, the word on this dictionary. You just put the page plus the whatever number. Uh, like, you just figure the, the, the position of that page in the dictionary. And so also language uh, has those kind of properties. 
things that are close by uh, have you know some kind of relationship things away are not less are less uh, you know correlated and then th similar patterns happen over and over again moreover you can use you know words to make sentences to make full essays and to make finally your write-ups for the sessions I'm just kidding, okay. All right, so, so uh, we already seen this one, so I'm gonna be going quite fast. Uh, there shouldn't be any, uh, I think, questions because also we have everything written down on the website, right? So you can always check the uh, summaries of the previous lesson on the website. Uh, so fully connected layer. So this actually perhaps is a new version of the diagram. Uh, that is my X, why is it at the bottom? Low level features, what's the color of that X? Pink, okay, good. All right, so we have an arrow which represents my, yeah, fine, that's the proper term, but I like to call them rotations. And then there is some squashing, right? The squashing means the nonlinearity. Then I have my hidden layer, then I have another rotation and a final squashing, okay? It's not necessary, maybe it can be a linear, you know, a final transformation, like a linear, uh, whatever function there, like if you do, if you perform a regression task. Uh, there you have the equations, right? Uh, and those guys can be any of those uh, non-linear functions, or even a linear function, right? If you perform a regression once more. And so you can write down these layers where I expand. So this guy here, the, the bottom guy, is actually a vector. And I represent the vector just with just one ball. There I just show you all the five items, elements of that vector. So you have the X, the, the first layer. Then you have the first hidden, second hidden, third hidden, the last layer. So we have how many layers? Five. Five, five okay. Uh, and then you can also call them activation layer one, layer two, three, four, and whatever. And then the matrices are where you store your parameters. So you have those different Ws. And then in order to get each of those values, you already seen this stuff, right? So I go quite faster. Uh, you perform just the scalar product, which means uh, you just do that thing. You get all those weights, uh, you multiply the input for each of those weights, and you keep going like that, right? And then you store those weights in those matrices and so on. So as you can tell, uh, there, is, there are a lot of arrows, right? And regardless uh, of the fact that I spent too many hours doing that drawing, this is also like very computationally expensive because there are so many computations, right? Each arrow uh, represents a weight which you have to multiply uh, for like by its own input. So what can we do now? So, given that our information is, uh, has locality, no? our data has this locality as a property, what does it mean? If I have something here, do I care what's happening here? So some of you are just shaking their hands, the rest of you, of you are kind of, I don't know, not responsive. Uh, do I have to ping you? So. Uh, we have locality, right? So things are just in specific regions. Do you actually care to look about far up away? No, okay, fantastic. And so let's simply drop some connections, right? So here we go from layer L minus one to the layer L by using uh, the first, you know, five, uh, 10, and 15, right? Plus I have the last one here, to from the layer L to L plus one, I have three more, right? So in total we have 18 uh, weights, uh, computations, right? So how about we drop the things that we don't care, right? So like, let's say for this neuron, perhaps why, why do we have to care about those guys there on the bottom, right? So for example, I can just use those three weights, right? I just forget about the other two. And then again, I just use those three weights, I skip the first and the last, and so on. Okay, so right now we have just nine connections, nine, just now nine uh, multiplications. And finally, uh, three more. So as we go from the left hand side to the right hand side, we uh, climb the hierarchy and we're gonna have a larger and larger uh, uh, view, right? So although these green bodies here don't see the whole input, as you keep climbing the uh, hierarchy, you're gonna be able to see the whole span of the input, right? Um, so in this case, we are gonna be uh, defining the RF as receptive field. 
So my receptive field here from the last neuron to the intermediate neuron is three. So what is gonna be, this means that the final neuron sees three uh, neurons from the previous layer. So what is the receptive field of the hidden layer with respect to the input layer? The answer was three, yeah, correct. But what is now the receptive field of the output layer with respect to the input layer? Five, right? That's fantastic. Okay, sweet. So right now, the whole architecture does see the whole input, while each subpart, like intermediate layers, only see small regions. And this is very nice because you spare computations, which are unnecessary because on average they have no whatsoever inf information. And so we managed to speed up uh, yeah, the computations and you actually can compute uh, things in a decent amount of time. Clear? So we can talk about sparsity only because we assume that our data shows locality, right? Question, if my data doesn't show locality, can I use sparsity? No, okay, fantastic, okay. All right, uh, more stuff. So we also said that these natural signals are stationary. And so, given that they're stationary, things appear over and over again. And so maybe we don't have to learn again and again the same stuff all, all over the time, right? So in this case, we said, oh, we drop those two lines, right? And so how about we use the first connection, the oblique one, from, you know, going in down, make it yellow. So all of those are yellow. Uh, then these are orange. And then the final one are red, right? So how many weights do I have here? And I had over here nine, right? And before we had 15, right? So we dropped from 15 to three. This is like a huge reduction. Perhaps now this actually won't work. So we have to fix that in a bit. But anyhow, in this way, when I train the network, I just had to train three weights, the red, green, sorry, the yellow, orange and red. Uh, and it's gonna be actually working even better because it just has to uh, learn, uh, you're gonna have more information, you're gonna have more data for you know, uh, training those specific weights. Um, so, so those are those three colors, the yellow, orange, and red, are gonna be called my kernel. And so I store them into a vector over here. Uh, and so, those, if you talk about you know, convolutional kernels, those are simply the weights of this uh, over here, right? The weights that we are using by using sparsity and then using parameter sharing. Parameter sharing means you use the same parameter over and over again across the architecture. So there are uh, the following nice properties of using those two combined. So parameter sharing gives us uh, faster convergence because you're gonna have much more information uh, to use in order to train these weights. Uh, you have a better generalization because you don't have to learn every time a specific type of thing that happened in different region. You just learn something that makes sense, uh, you know, globally. Um, then we also have, we are not constrained to the input size. This is so important, right? Also Jan said this uh, thing three times yesterday. Uh, why are we not constrained to the input size? Because we can keep shifting it over, right? Before, in this other case, if you have more neurons, you have to learn new stuff, right? In this case, I can simply add more neurons and I keep using my weights across, right? That was uh, uh, some of the major points Jan, uh, you know, uh, highlighted yesterday. Uh, moreover, we have the kernel independence. <laughs> So for the one of you that are interested in optimization, uh, optimizing like computation, this is so cool because this kernel and another kernel are completely independent, so you can train them, you can parallelize this uh, to make things go faster. Um, okay. So finally, we have also some connection sparsity property, and so here we have a, redu a reduced amount of computation, which is also very good. So all these properties allowed us to be able to train this network on a lot of data. 
you still require a lot of data, but without having sparsity in locality, sorry, uh, without having sparsity in uh, parameter sharing, you wouldn't be able to actually finish training this network in a re reasonable amount of time. Um, so let's see, for example, now how this works when you have like an audio signal, which is uh, how many dimensional signal? One dimensional signal, right? Okay. So for example, kernels for 1D data. On the right hand side, you're going to see again my, uh, my neurons. And I'm going to be using my uh, different, uh, the first kernel here. And so I'm going to be storing my kernel there in that vector. For example, I can have a second kernel, right? So right now we have two kernels, the blue, purple, and pink, and the yellow, orange, and red. Uh, so let's say my output is R2. So that means that each of those uh, bubbles here, or each of those neurons, are actually one and two, right? They come out from the, from the board, right? So each, each of those are uh, having a thickness of two. Uh, and let's say the other guy here are having a thickness of seven, right? So they are coming outside from the screen and they are, you know, seven neurons in this way. So in this case, my kernel are going to be of size two times seven times three. So two means I have two kernels which are going from seven to give me uh, three outputs. Um, yeah, hold on, my bad. So uh, the two means you have R2, right, here. Because you have two kernels, so the first kernel will give you the first, uh, the first column here, and the second kernel is going to give you the second column. Uh, then it has to, it needs seven, because it needs to match all the thickness of the previous layer. And then it has three, because there are three connections, right? So maybe I, I, miss, I got confused before. Does it make sense, the sizing? So given that there are two, seven, three, two means you have two kernels, and therefore you have two items here, like one and one coming out for each of those columns. Uh, it has seven because each of these have a thickness of seven. And finally, three means there are three connections connecting to the previous layer. Right, so 1D data uses 3D kernels, okay? So if I call this my collection of kernel, right? So if those are going to be stored in a, a tensor, this tensor will be a three-dimensional tensor. So question for you. If I'm going to be playing now with images, what is the size of a you know, full pack of kernels for an image uh, convolutional net? Four, right? So we are going to have the number of kernels, then it's going to be the number of uh, the thickness, uh, and then you're going to have connections in height and connection in width. Okay? So if you're going to be checking the, kern the convolutional kernels uh, later on in your notebook, actually you should check that. You should find the same kind of dimensions. All right, so questions so far? Is this so clear? Yeah. Um, are you sure that the uh, sparsity and uh, sharing parameters are going to increase the, uh, let's say, are going to uh, make results faster, better performances, etc.? I was wondering how much this can be boosted. So, even in case is when all the weights are the same and the network is as fast as possible. So, I guess my question is how much this is going to affect the performances and what is the trade off? To Okay, so good question. So uh, trade-off about you know sizing uh, of those convolutions, uh, convolutional kernels, right? Is it correct? Right. So three by three, it seems to be like the minimum you can go for if you actually care about spatial information. Uh, as Jan pointed out, you can also use one by one convolution. Oh, sorry, one com one like. A convolution which which has only one weight, or if you use like in uh, images, you have a one by one convolution. Uh, those are used in order to be uh, having like a final layer which is still uh, spatial, right? it still can uh, be applied to a larger input image. Um, right now, we just use kernels that are three or maybe five. Uh, it's kind of empirical, so it's not like uh, we don't have like a magic formulas, but. Uh, We've been 
trying hard in the past 10 years to figure out what is you know the best set of hyperparameters and if you check uh, for each field like for uh, speech processing visual processing like image processing you're gonna figure out what is the right compromise for your specific data yeah uh, always odd numbers Second? Okay, that's a good question. Why odd numbers? Uh, why the kernel has an odd uh, uh, number of elements? Uh, so if you actually have an odd number of elements, there will be a central element, right? If you have an even number of elements, there, will no, there won't be a central value. So if you have, again, an odd number, you know that from a specific point, you're going to be considering an even number of left and even number of right items. If it's an even size kernel, then you actually don't know where the center is, and the center is going to be the average of two uh, neighboring samples, which actually creates like a, a low-pass filter effect. So even uh, kernel sizes are not usually uh, preferred or not usually used because they imply some kind of uh, additional lowering of the quality of the data. Okay, so one more thing that we mentioned also yesterday, uh, it's padding. Padding is something uh, that if it has an effect on the final results is getting it worse, but it's very convenient uh, for programming side. So if we pad our, so as you can see here, when we apply convolution uh, from this layer, you're gonna end up with, huh, okay, how many, how many neurons we have here? And we started from five. So if we use a convolutional kernel of three, we lose how many neurons? Two. Two, okay. One per side. If we are going to be using a convolutional kernel of size five, how much are you going to be losing? Four, right? And so that's the rule usually. Zero padding, you have to add an extra uh, neuron here, an extra neuron here. So you're gonna do number size of the kernel, right? Three minus one divided by two, and then you add that extra whatever number of neurons here, and you set them to zero. Why to zero? Because usually you zero mean uh, your inputs, or you zero each layer output by using some normalization layers. Um, in this case, yeah, three comes from the size of the kernel, and then you have that um, some animation should be playing. Yeah, you have one extra neuron there, there. Then I have an extra neuron there, such that finally you end up with these, you know, ghost neurons there. But now you have the same number of input and the same number of output, and this is so convenient because if we started with I don't know 64 neurons, you apply a convolution, you still have 64 neurons, and therefore you can use let's say a max pooling of two. You're gonna end up at 32 neurons. Otherwise, you're gonna have this. I don't know if you consider one, uh, you have an odd number, right? So you don't know what to do um, after a bit, right? Um, okay, so yeah, and you have the same size. All right, so let's see how much time we have left. We have a, a, a bit of time. So let's see uh, how we use uh, this convolutional network in practice. So this is like the theory behind, and we have said that we can use convolutions. Uh, so this is a convolutional operator. I didn't even define what's a convolution. We just said that if our data has stationarity, locality, and is actually Compositional, compositional, then we can exploit this by using weight sharing, sparsity, and then you know by stacking several of this layer, you have a, like a hierarchy, right? Uh, so by using this kind of operation, this is a convolution. I didn't even define it. I don't care right now. Maybe next class. Uh, so this is like the theory behind. Uh, now we're gonna see a little bit of practical, uh, you know, suggestions how we actually use this stuff in practice. So let's say we have like a standard a spatial convolutional net, which is operating on which kind of data? If it's spatial, it's spatial because it's my network, right? Spatial. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. So spatial is you know space. Uh, so in this case, uh, we have multiple layers, of course, we stack them. We also talk about why it's better to have several layers rather than having a fat layer. 
Uh, we have convolutions, of course. We have no linearities because otherwise. So, okay, next time we're gonna see how a convolution can be implemented with matrices, but convolutions are just linear operator with which a lot of zeros and like a replication of the same weights. But otherwise, if you don't use uh, non-linearity, uh, a convolution of a convolution is gonna be a convolution. So we have to clean up uh, stuff. Um, so we have to like put barriers, right, in order to avoid collapse of the whole network. Uh, we have some pooling operator, uh, which uh, Geoffrey says that's you know something really bad, but you know we are still doing that. Uh, Hinton, right? Geoffrey Hinton. Um, then we have something that if you don't use it, uh, your network is not going to be training. So just use it. Uh, although we don't know exactly why it works, but uh, I think there is a question on Piazza. Uh, we'll put a link there. Uh, about this batch normalization. Also, Jan is going to be covering all the normalization layers. Uh, finally, we have something that also is uh, quite recent, uh, which is called uh, residual or bypass connections, which are basically these uh, extra connections, which allow me to uh, get the network, you know, the network decided whether, whether to send information uh, through this line or actually send it forward. If you stack so many, many layers, one after each other, the signal gets lost a little bit after some time. Uh, if you add these additional connections, you always have like a path in order to go back uh, from the bottom to the top and also to have gradients coming down from the top to the bottom. So that's actually uh, very important. <laughs> Both the residual connection and the batch normalization are really, really helpful to get this network to uh, properly train. Uh, if you don't use them, then it's going to be quite hard to get those networks to really work uh, for the training part. Uh, so how does it work? We have here uh, an image, for example, uh, where most of the information is uh, spatial information. So the information is spread across the two dimensions. Although there is a thickness, and I call the thickness as characteristic information, which means it provides a information at that specific point. So what is my characteristic information in this image? Let's say it's a RGB image. It's a color image, right? So we have most of the information is spread on a spatial, uh, so it's spatial information, like if you have me making uh, funny faces. Uh, but then at each point, uh, this is not a grayscale image, it's a color image, right? So each point will have an ad additional information, which is my uh, you know, specific uh, ca characteristic information. What is it in this case? A vector of three values. It's a vector of three values, which represent yeah, RGB are the three letters, but what does it represent? Okay, o overall, what does it represent? Like, intensity. yeah, it's intensity. Just you know, tell me in English without weird uh, things. Color the color of the pixel, right? So my specific information, my characteristic information. Yeah, I don't know what you were saying. Sorry. The characteristic information in this case is just the color, right? So the color is the only information that is specific there, but then otherwise information is spread around. Uh, as we climb, climb the hierarchy, you can see now some uh, final vector, which has, let's say we are doing classification in this case. So my, uh, you know, the height and width of that thing is gonna be one by one, so it's just one vector. And then let's say there you have the specific final logit, which is the highest one. So which is representing the class which is most likely to be uh, the correct one if it's trained well. Uh, in the midway, you have something that is you know, a trade-off between spatial information and then this characteristic information. Okay? So basically, there is like a conversion between spatial information into this characteristic information. Do you see? So it basically you go from a thing uh, input uh, data to something that is very thick, but then has no more information, spatial information. And so you can see here uh, with my Ninja PowerPoint skills, how you can get you know, a reduction of the well, uh, thickener, like a thicker, thicker uh, you know, representation, whereas you actually uh, lose the spatial, uh, spatial one. Okay, so that was, uh, oh, one more, pooling. So pooling is simply, uh, again, for example, uh, 
it can be performed in this way. So there you have some hand drawing because I didn't want to, I didn't have time to make it in LaTeX. Uh, so you have different regions. You apply a specific uh, operator to that specific region. For example, you have the P norm. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, if the P goes to uh, plus infinity, you have the max. Uh, and then that one is going to give you one value, right? Then you perform a stride, like you, you jump uh, two pixels further, and then you again you compute the same thing. You're going to get another value there, and so on until you end up from your data, which was n by n with c channels. You get still c channels, but then in this case you're going to get m half and c uh, and n half half. Okay, and this is for images. Okay? Uh, there are no parameters on the pooling. Uh, you can nevertheless choose which kind of pooling, right? You can choose max pooling, uh, average pooling, any pooling is wrong, so uh, <laughs> yeah, that's also the problem. Okay, so this was the main part with the slides. We are going to uh, see now the notebooks. Uh, I will go a bit slower this time. Uh, I noticed that last time I kind of rushed. Um, so are there any questions so far on this part that we covered? Yeah? Uh, so there is like uh, Geoffrey Hinton is renowned for saying that max pooling is something which is just wrong because you just throw away information as you average or you take the max you just throw away things uh, he's been working on like something called capsule networks which have you know specific uh, routing uh, paths that are choosing you know some better strategies in order to avoid like throwing away information okay yeah, basically that's the the argument behind yeah is the purpose just to like make yeah so the main purpose of using this pooling or the stride is actually to get rid of uh, a lot of uh, data such that you can compute things in a reasonable amount of time usually you need a lot of stride or pooling at the first layers so at the bottom because otherwise it's absolutely you know too uh, computationally expensive yeah And also, like you were saying before, the um, kernel size, that's all like empirically determined what the optimal is. Uh, yeah, so that's it. Um, those network architectures are so far driven by, you know, state of the art, which is completely uh, empirical based. Uh, we try hard and we actually got to, I mean, now we actually arrived to some kind of standard. So. A few years back, I was answering, like, I don't know, but right now we actually have determined some good configurations, especially using those residual connections and the uh, batch normalization, we actually <coughs> can get to train basically everything. Yeah? Do the residual connections get updated twice during like, back propagation, or is it just like at the later point? So they're like being brought up later in the network, right? Uh, so basically, you're going to have your gradient at a specific point coming down as well, and then you have the other gradient coming down. down. Then you had a branch, right, a branching, and if you have branch, what's happening with the gradient? That's correct, yeah, they get added, right? So you have the two gradients coming from two different branches getting added together. All right, so let's go to the notebooks such that we can cover the, uh, we don't rush too much. So here I just go through the component part. So here I train, um, initially, I load the MNIST data set, so I show you a few uh, characters here, okay? And I, I train now a multi-layer perceptron, like a fully connected network, like a, multi, uh, you know, uh, yeah, fully connected network and a convolutional neural net, which have the same number of parameters, okay? So these two models will have the same dimension in terms of the, if you save them, we'll weight the same. So uh, I'm training here this guy here with the uh, fully connected network. It takes a little bit of time and it gets some 87%, okay? This is trained on classification of the MNIST digits from Jan. Uh, he actually downloads from his website if you check. Anyhow, I train a convolutional neural net with the same number of parameters. What do you expect? to have a better or worse result. So my multi-layer perceptron gets 87%. What do we get with a convolutional net? 
Yes. Why? Okay, so what is the point here of using sparsity? What does it mean? Given that we have the same number of parameters, we managed to train much uh, more filters, right, in the second case. Because in the first case, we use filters that are completely trying to get some dependencies between things that are further away with things that are closed by. So they are completely wasted. Basically, they learn zero. Instead, in the convolutional net, I have all these parameters that are just concentrated for figuring out what is the relationship between a neighboring, neighboring pixels. All right, so now I take the pixels. I shake, everything just got scrambled. But I keep the same, I scramble the same, the same way all the images. So I perform a random permutation, always the same random permutation of all my images, or the pixels of my images. What does it happen if I train both networks? So here I train, see here I have my pix images, and here I just scramble with the same scrambling function, all the pixels. What are you playing for? Um, I have my, my inputs are gonna be these images here. The output is gonna be still the, the class of the original. So this is a four. You can't see, this, this is a four. This is a nine. <laughs> this is a one, this is a seven, this is a three, and this is a four. So I keep the same labels but I scramble the order of the pixels and I perform the same scrambling every time. What do you expect as performance? Who's better, who's working, who's the same? Perceptron, how does it do, how does it do with the perceptron? Does it see any difference? No, okay. So that guy, still 83. Jan's network? <laughs> what do you guess? Oh, oh, oh. No, oh, that's the fully connected, sorry. Uh, I'll change the order. Yeah, see? Okay, there you go. So, I can't even show you this thing. All right. So the fully connected guy basically performs the same. The differences are just basic, based on the initial, uh, the random initialization. The convolutional net, which was winning uh, by kind of large advance, uh, advantage before, actually performs uh, kind of ish similarly. But I mean, worse than, much worse than before. Why is the convolutional network now performing worse than my fully connected network? Because we fucked up, okay? And so every time you use a convolutional network, you actually have to think, can I use a convolutional network, okay? Uh, if it holds, you know, you have the three properties, then yeah, maybe, of course, it should be giving you a better performance. If those three properties don't hold, then using convolutional networks is BS, right? Which was the bias, no. Okay, never mind. All right, bye-bye, good night. <laughs>